I'm from uh, Dedham, Massachusetts. Uh, it's about 12 miles outside of Boston. And uh, I was growing up, you know, minding my own business. I was buckling down. I was going to school. Uh, I was going to a Latin school. Where you study Greek and Latin and, uh, you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic subjects, which have come in handy over the years. And uh, no longer needed, evidently. But, um, <laughs> but uh, at any rate, so there I was, uh, minding my own business, 12 or 13 years old. And a buddy of mine in school says, you've got to listen to this radio station. It's the funniest thing you've ever heard. And uh, so I, he was a good buddy. He would never steer me wrong. And so uh, <laughs> I turned it on. WCOP in Boston. And the fir very, very first thing I heard coming out of that radio was uh, this band. They called themselves the Confederate Mountaineers. It was Everett and B. Lilly, Don Stover, and Tex Logan. Well, you could have plugged me in. It was so shocking. It was, it, I just, everything in me started jangling. And in a way, I, I attribute it to um, my Irish genes. And uh, this music sounded f uh, familiar to me. There was something about it that just immediately affected me. You know, my friend was saying, oh, it's the funniest thing you've ever heard. And it, like songs like, Mother's Not Dead, She's Only Sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I wasn't laughing. I, I just ate it up, and I was, they were on the radio. It's hard to believe. That's like 1951, the end of 1951. Uh, every night, every weeknight, for 15 minutes from 7.45 to 8 o'clock, live. And um, Everett had just come from playing with Lester Flatt and Earl Scruggs. And wh what were they doing there? Um, Tex Logan was a very brilliant guy. And he was an electronic, he studied electronic engineering. And he went to Texas A&M. And uh, then he, he was also just a crazy fiddler, a, a very unique fiddler. He played in tunings. Nobody played like Tex. And he was on the Wheeling Jamboree uh, and uh, got to know the Lilly Brothers and Don Stover down there. And then he came up to Boston to go to MIT to get a master's degree. And so he was up there, and he heard this radio station with a hillbilly show called the Hayloft Jamboree, and they had shows in Symphony Hall in Boston once a month, and there were about half a dozen bars in Boston at the time catering to sailors who were at the Navy Yard there, and a lot of, a lot of kids from the mountains in the south joined the Navy to see the world. And they were seeing the seamier side of Boston, as it turned out. So, uh, but, and so these bar owners uh, realized that they better get some music in there that these kids would like. And so right away, there was, I would say, four or five of these bars around Boston. The Hillbilly Ranch was the one that lasted the longest. And the Lilly Brothers wound up playing there for 18 years. Uh, and if you've ever done any of this kind of work, Bill Keith and I substituted for them a couple of times. They, they had a two-week vacation without pay every year. They would go back to West Virginia. And we, we did this, you know, half hour on, half hour off from 8 o'clock till 1 in the morning uh, to a bunch of people that could care less mostly. And uh, it was hard work. And uh, they were making about 125 bucks a week each. And, but they did it for all those years and raised their family. Uh, and uh, so I got to be friends with them eventually, uh, good friends, lifelong friends. And uh, so uh, that was where I began. And the other element there, they had a disc jockey uh, named Nelson Bragg. He was from Maine. The Merry Mayor of Milo, Maine. That was his billing. And, and he was a real down east character. And he didn't try to pretend he was from the South or anything. But, you know, 
this was Hank Williams, Lefty Frizzell, Hank Snow, Hank Thompson. All of these people were alive and hitting it hard. I mean, absolutely every song you heard on the radio was unbelievably good. And I got hooked on that. I got totally hooked on Hank Williams. I brought a little artifact here. I have a stack of song books and things at home, you know, about that high. This is on top of it. Uh, <laughs> there's a second one. And Hank Williams, he just got into me. Uh, he, and I wasn't the only one, of course. I mean, he just killed everybody that heard him. And, and then, uh, you know, I'm so lonesome I could cry. I was like, you know, 14, 15 years old. I wanted to be that sad. I really wanted, <laughs> you know. Uh, no, girl would, no girl would talk to me, you know. And, uh, and I loved them, but they didn't know I loved them. And I couldn't say it. I didn't know how to do it. And it was tough. And Hank spoke to me. And he also had funny songs, you know, no matter how I struggle and strive, I'll never get out of this world alive. And uh, I just loved it all. And so my uncle, thank God, my uncle Jim, uh, saw me strumming a tennis racket one night. And he came out and he used to visit and he brought me a ukulele. And uh, little Roy Smeck ukulele. I just gave my grandson one. He's two. <laughs> I found a Roy Smith ukulele just like the one I started out with. And he's got the Elvis moves down with it, but he hasn't figured out the first chord. But evidently, <laughs> you don't have to know those things. At any rate, uh, I got that ukulele going, and I started getting country song roundup, and letting the lyrics of the songs, and, and I had a good ear. I didn't have to be told when to change chords, which was uh, uh, lucky. Not everybody has that. So... I started singing away, and my girl cousins thought it was really funny to see little Jimmy singing Backstreet Affair and, uh, and Your Cheating Heart and all, that, all this stuff. And, uh, it, and I, as long as the girls liked it, I liked it too. It was, it was fun. And so uh, I got going. And then I bought a guitar from a buddy of mine for $12 and a plywood guitar with action that would just unbelievably, you know, you're, I, was, I mean, your fingers are bleeding and you have to want to do it. And the first song I played, I was just looking at this yesterday, um, Darling, Let's Turn Back the Years. It only has two chords, C and G, and I could play it the very first day. I, and um, I can't, I'll show you later, but I'm left-handed. So I picked up that ukulele backwards. Well, it doesn't matter. You're just strumming away. Put your fingers where the dots are and play away. Well, then I got the guitar home. And I, uh, well, maybe I should do it right, you know. So I changed the strings around. But it's, you know, people today... Kids know everything. They can go on YouTube. They can find everything they want to know. I didn't know anything. I didn't know anybody who knew anything about this stuff. So I changed those strings around, but I didn't change the nut or anything. So the big strings were in the little grooves, and the thing rattled and uh, rattled. It also came with a finger pick. Went over your fingernail. That's what I thought. Yeah. And uh, so I, after you know, getting nothing out of that guitar with the strings in the proper place. I just put it back the way it was, played it backwards and upside down, and uh, that was it, and still is it. Um, so uh, one day I was listening to the show. They had a live show every Saturday afternoon as well. And these two girls were on there, and they were really bad. They sounded like, if you, anybody remembers the Davis sisters, Skeeter Davis and Bonnie, they had a big hit. Uh, and uh, it was the end of the world. <laughs> and uh, don't talk me, it's the end of the world. Well, these two girls really sounded like a couple of cats on a fence. So <laughs> I said, I'm as good as they are. And I got my little guitar and its little canvas sack with little buttons shut your cutting it. And I went in to the radio station, and it was a big big station in the middle of Boston. 
they had studios in there, and they had a big, in the lobby, they had an Al Cap kind of Lil Abner mural of hillbillies having fun. <laughs> and all the guys, they had a, this Hayloft Jamboree, by this time the resident star was Elton Britt, who was a great yodeler, singer, and had big hits during, there's a Star Spangled Banner waving somewhere, and Cannonball Yodel, and all these songs. He was a very nice man, very nice to me. And at any rate, uh, they had all these other guys. They had a guy who sounded like Hank Snow and a guy who sounded like Eddie Arnold and uh, an Armenian Western swing band from Providence <laughs> and uh, Eddie Zach and the Dude Ranchers. And, and so I went in there. All those guys are sitting around in the lobby waiting for the radio show to start, and they were all dressed up in their cowboy outfits. It was radio, but they lived the life. They were living the life all the time. So I went in there and I met the guy who was running the show. And he says, uh, I said, I'd like to audition. I can't believe I did this, actually. Uh, I, I got in there on the trolley. You know, I took a bus and a trolley all by myself and got in there. And I had the nerve to ask him if I could audition. <laughs> so he said, OK. And he brought me in at a studio. Well, you know, half the size of this room that could have an audience in it. It was a big, it just, it was empty. He says, okay, play me something. I'll do this. I have a plan on oh, just a little bit. And uh, this is by a, uh, this, this is by a Canadian singer-songwriter. Um, you might have heard of. He's from Liverpool, Canada, uh, Nova Scotia. He's a Canadian. Uh, well, they didn't call them singer-songwriters back then. They didn't call any of these people singer-songwriters. And they all were singer-songwriters. Uh, Hank Snow. Well, you listen to a story about a gal I know. She's a music making mama on the hill, baby, boo. Sweeter than the music meant to take us a strain. Sweeter than the flowers down in New Orleans. Music making mama from Memphis, Tennessee. And he, so I did that. And he said, you got anything else? Uh, yeah, I got, uh, well, I left my home on a rural route. I told my pap I'm going stepping out and get them honky tonk blues. Oh, the honky tonk blues. Oh, Lord, I got them. I got them ho -ho honky tonk blues. Oh, I'm sorry. So he, well, do you want to be on the radio, kid? Yeah. Today? Yeah. Do you believe this? And so <laughs> I, I found a phone somewhere. I called up my house, my folks. I said, I'm going to be on the radio. And uh, I called my buddy who'd sent me in there in the first place who thought this was so funny. And, uh, and I was on the radio. He, there was this man from Torrington, Connecticut, uh, Cappy Paxton and the Trailsman. And he told Cappy, give me a guitar that played. And, and, uh, and they told me to back me up on, on uh, music making more. And they did. And they were really nice, nice to me. And uh, I, this was, oh, I was 16. Uh, I weighed about 110. And I'm as tall as I am now. <laughs> And you get the picture, uh, kind of a, a stick. And uh, 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 so at any rate, and then I, he said, they were really nice to me. And so you did a, I did a good job and um, didn't screw up. And so um, he said, well, why don't you come back next week? I said, OK, I'll come back next week. And then I came back next week, and he said, well, we do the shows every Friday night at John Hancock Hall, and so you, why don't you do that next Friday? So I went home. I said, well, uh, I'm going to be on the Jamboree next Friday, and I need to get some clothes. <laughs> you know, this was not my parents. They did not dream of this in their, you know, their <laughs> dreams of me for the future. And uh, I had to buy, get my mother to buy me some powder blue pig pants and pleats. And I wanted to look sharp, you know, if I was going to be a star. And, uh, and I was a star for a while. And then um, 
That summer, we went off to the country where we didn't have a phone or anything, and they didn't. Do, they stopped the shows during the summer. When I came back, the whole thing was gone. A radio format change, and uh, everything changed. And they all vanished. The Lilly Brothers kept working those hillbilly bars, but that everything was gone. It was quite shocking. And I'd worked all summer long, picking berries and selling vegetables by the side of the road, and I saved up to buy a Martin guitar just like this one, D18, bought it in 1954 for 135 bucks, no discount. And uh, I had that guitar for 22 years before it was stolen. This is, but this is just like it, almost the same year. It's the only kind of guitar I've ever played. And um, so that's what got me going. And then in college, and but the show was gone, and I was left to my own devices. And I found a bookstore in Boston that sold records in the back, folk records. And I started buying them, Folkways records. I bought Big Bill Brunsey, Lead Belly, uh, eventually, uh, American banjo Scrug style. Mike Seeger recorded. I was, I was, and uh, uh, Reverend Gary Davis, Kenneth Goldstein recorded. And I was hearing. I didn't know it at the time, but I was the beneficiary. I thought the t Pete Seeger's Talking Union uh, of of the people like the Lomaxes, Mike Seeger, Kenneth Goldstein, all these people who were out there recording in the field or in little studios here and there. And I was starting to soak, soak it all up. And my mother understood that I needed to keep this in my life. She, she gave me a present of Carl Sandburg's American Song Bag. And I just started reading it, going from page to page. And then, this is my other visual aid, I got this. Harry Smith's Anthology of American Folk Music. Well, there it all is. I mean, I've just been, I, you know, I've had these things forever. And, and you just open any page, any page at all. Here we got, um, if I could read, I, it'd be a help. Um, I don't know, maybe not that page. Uh, <laughs> I'm looking for some hits here. Uh, well, at any rate, uh, I can't read if I imprint my eyes are all watery. But um, take my word for it. There's the old plank road, Uncle Dave Macon, the Carter family. Uh, um, see that my grave is kept clean. I mean, uh, gone uh, fishing, uh, Henry Thomas. Uh, every cut in here is a treasure. And Harry, I met him years later with Ralph Rinsler. He was a nut. But we need nuts, uh, except when they're president. Um, uh, they're OK when you give them some music to deal with, but not an atomic bomb. Uh, at, at any rate. Uh, and so I, this was the beginning for me, these two areas of music. And there was also one more guy I have to give some credit to. Uh, another disc jockey in Boston called Symphony Sid. When the, when the Hillbilly Show went away, um, my buddy t said, well, listen to this one. And Sid, Sid was a famous disc jockey, eventually wound up in New York. He was, he was playing uh, R&B in the afternoon, so I'm hearing Fats Domino, Little Richard, Clyde McFadder, Ruth Brown. I'm hearing, then he goes to jazz, Dizzy Gillespie, Duke Ellington, uh, Slim and Slam, uh, great stuff. And then he became Brother Sid at 5 o'clock and played Mahalia Jackson, Five Blind Boys of Alabama, Jave Cleveland. I mean, this was such a radio at this time for me. Between those two stations, they covered so much music for me, and I just wanted it all. And it has stayed with me my whole life. And so it just, and then the other big important thing that happened to me in college, I met Bill Keith. And he was just, he was on the last page of Pete Seeger's banjo book. And he'd gotten to Earl Scruggs. And so he was, 
I said, well, I know that some of that stuff. Um, and I said, I know a banjo player in Boston. Named, you, go, you should go here. Don Stover, one of the greatest banjo players ever to live. And there he was at the Hillbilly Ranch. Any night of the week, he wanted to go hear him. And so Bill and I started playing together. And we came up with a mixture of songs. I was using some of the songs from uh, the Sandberg book, like Kentucky Moonshiner and, and Pretty Polly. And, um, and then I made up a melody. I, was, I started making melodies up to words I found in books. And one morning in May, we recorded. And then we were doing strict bluegrass. We teamed up with Joe Val. It was the first time Joe had ever been recorded. <coughs> And we all made a record for Prestige Records in 1962. And Joe was such a great, great influence on us because he was a, a pro. He'd done this for a while at this time with no kind of recognition from anybody. But playing in this environment, we were playing at the Club 47 to a different audience than the Hillbilly Ranch where people really appreciated Joe. And uh, it all worked for all of us. And that was the beginning of, of my lifelong relationship with Bill. And, you know, I learned uh, so much from him musically. All you needed to do was sit around Bill Keith when he was playing the banjo or practicing or anything, and you were going to hear music. You were going to develop your musical ear. He taught me about harmony singing and stuff like that. And um, so, we kept going all the all through the years and so i eventually uh at that time in the early 60s another person i'd like to acknowledge is eric von schmidt he was of the an older generation uh jack elliott dave van rock he was a few years older than me and the rest of us eric had been to the library of congress he had had this, of course, he had all the stuff. And he was, he loved to have people come over. And we would just listen to music night and day. Jim Queskin, Jeff Muldar, Maria Muldar, uh, Fritz Richmond, all of us were just soaking it up all the time. And we were sharing our passions with each other. If, you know, someone was interested in jug music, uh, jug band music, or someone was interested in country blues or something, we all educated each other about music. And then we got to see so many of the people that were in this anthology in person. We got so, Clarence Ashley, uh, Mississippi John Hurt, the Cart, uh, Maybell and Sarah Carter. I mean, when we finally, this was such an amazing time in our history when these two generations came together. And now I'm in an older generation now. And I feel it's very important. I want people to continue to go back to these sources and listen and spend a lot of time listening. I think that's probably something that we are not doing enough of these days. It just spends, I've, I've had some periods in my life when I had to stop. I, I was busy, I ran the Club 47 for several years and worked at the Newport Festival and after and worked for Albert Grossman and I did a lot of stuff and eventually, you have to look after yourself and then go back inside. And in those times, I started listening to music intensely again and also finding people to share my interests with. And that eventually led me to Nashville, where I came under the influence of a man named Jack Clement, Cowboy Jack Clement. And Jack had also been on the Hayloft Jamboree. I missed meeting him at, by about a month. He was up there with Scotty Stoneman of the Stoneman family, a great, great show fiddler. And Buzz Busby, who was a wild mandolin player. And they had a trio called the Bayou Boys. And I heard them on the radio and saw them on the Jamboree, but I never met Jack at the time. 
But I followed his career after he left Boston. He went to Memphis, where he was from. He started working for Sam Phillips. Whole first record he cut was a whole lot of shaking going on. He he wrote the B side. It'll be me, and I'll be looking for you. And uh, and he did a ballad of a teenage queen. He wrote that. I don't like it, but I guess things happen that way. One of my favorites for Johnny Cash. He did uh, Just a Girl I Used to Know for George Jones. And then he came to Nashville. He produced all of Charlie Pride's records. I mean, nobody would touch Charlie Pride, but Jack Clement did. He heard him. He heard him. And and he did Waylon Jennings. And, uh, and so I met him in 1976. And he gave me every opportunity in that world in Nashville. And Jack attracted creative, generous people to him. And he was a generous, creative person himself. These weren't a bunch of shysters or crooks or people on the make. They were serious, creative, wonderful people. And I became part of that family. And he got me into recording, engineering. He said, you can do this. It's not that hard. <laughs> and uh, and he said, learn how to you know turn the switch on and keep the needles in the middle and uh, you know he said you know what music's supposed to sound like, <laughs> you've got good ears so you know mess with it just record it and get it right and uh, he threw me into the deep end of the pool I recorded uh, Carl Perkins and Billy Lee Riley uh, all kinds of people. I recorded everybody who came into his studio for about five or six years. And then, I, I, then because of that, I was able to record people. I recorded Alison Krauss's first album, Edgar Meyer's first album. It was, it was an incredible opportunity. He never asked anything in return. No money was ever mentioned. And so uh, that got me into producing and, and uh, you know, probably 150 or 200 albums, a lot of albums, with people that I really believe in. And a lot of the artists I believe in have this traditional music in them. They have listened themselves. John Prine, Iris DeMint, Nancy Griffith, they listen a lot, and it shows in their music. And that's what I'm kind of uh, on my horse about here in terms of getting everybody to go back, get those records out that turned you on in the first place, get your Merle Haggard records out, get your, get your Johnny Cash records out, get your, get your uh, John Hurt records out. Uh, it's all there. We, we are blessed you know, to have all of this stuff at our fingertips now. You might not have your tattered albums intact at home. They might not even play anymore. Some of mine don't play. But I can go get it, and I can listen to it. And I've been doing a lot of listening lately uh, just to refresh myself. I'm 80 years old, and you, you need to take time every so often. I know we're all busy, and we're all trying to make a living, trying to do what we need to do. You need to take that time to listen and get back into what turned you on in the first place. And it will. It's still there. It's absolutely still there, and it will it will enable you to um, kind of freshen yourself up and uh, go out and and spread this music with renewed energy. Um, and I think these conferences are good for people to get together. It's always good. We had some really incredible times. Uh, you know, in my life where you get together with other people and it, and it gives you a lot of support and you're not alone and you're doing this uh, with other people and it makes an impact. And I think right now in our history, more than ever maybe, we need to remind ourselves of our humanity. We, this music does it. This is all about, all about that. Uh, I'll read you just what Eric von Schmidt said about the Harry Smith thing. 
Here was the real thing. Lead Belly, Woody Guthrie, Sonny and Brownie, and if you cared to go even further, and you did, you entered the amazing world of American folk music according to Harry Smith. Here you met Sleepy John Estes, uh, Delma Lancey, De Blind Uncle Gaspard, <laughs> Nell Stone's High Hawaiians, the Carolina Tar Heels, Floyd King and his Pep Steppers, Blind Lemon Jefferson, the Masked Marvel, Uncle Dave Macon, the Fruit Jar Drinkers, Mississippi John Hurt, Blind Willie Johnson, Ken Maynard, American Boy's favorite cowboy, and many, many more. You are now in full folk thrall. For, th <laughs> for this music sounded like it came right out of the ground. Songs like the clods of rich, dark earth, fecund and timeless. And that's what we want to get to. That's what we want to keep doing. Thank you. Sorry, I, I forgot to do my ending. And, and you, can, you can do this with me. Um, as I said, Jack Clement attracted a very creative group of people, and two of them were songwriters, Alan Reynolds and Bob McDill. And it, it was a wild, it was, no, I'm good. I, I, oh, my cord, yeah. I'm a pro professional. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, at any rate, Alan, uh, Alan and Bob wrote a song about uh, Jack and his crew. And Jack had this joke that they were all going to fly off to Alpha Centauri someday <laughs> in a spaceship. And uh, uh, you can sing this the refrain. It's, um, it, you'll hear it. Matt is the captain of Alpha Centauri. We must be out of our minds Though we are shipmates and bound for tomorrow Everyone here is flying blind We must believe in magic We must believe in the guiding hand If you believe in magic You'll have the universe at your command. Old is the mad is the crew bound for Alpha Centauri. Dreamers and poets and clowns. Old is the ship bound for Alpha Centauri. Nothing can turn it around. Sing it. We must believe in magic We must believe in the guiding hand If you believe in magic You'll have the universe at your command We must believe in magic We must believe in the guiding hand If you believe in magic You'll have the universe at your command. Thank you.